All right, we are live here on Off the Cuff with Richard Weikart, who has decided to uh, condescend and come on to my little show after <laughs> uh, all the shows he's done over the years. For those of you who don't know, I, I got a lot of respect for you, uh, Richard, for all the stuff you've written. You've done a lot of great books that have been, like I was telling you in our little pre-show prep, that have been a blessing to me in some of my studies and research into uh, human sacredness and just where where I'm taking a lot of my studies so appreciate you doing it um, uh, and and coming on it's it's uh, it's a means a lot to me so I'm thankful I want to introduce more of your stuff to more people so this is a great way to do it um, yeah, thanks for having me on yeah so for those who uh, don't know or that don't read or whatever have ever discussed this topic of eugenics which we want to look at today uh, Richard has written multiple books that touch on this area from different angles his original book from Darwin to Hitler uh, related to his PhD stuff that he did uh, over uh, seas and uh, it's a great book great resource but then he's did uh, done Hitler's ethic Hitler's religion uh, oh the death of humanity I think those are the big ones right that I've covered yeah those are the, yeah, those are the main yeah. ones yeah yeah and then he's currently working on a new book on eugenics specifically in the United States right specifically in America no it's not actually on the United States it's oh. uh, the w book I'm working on now is, uh, is actually on Darwinian racism in the Nazi worldview I do actually, oh, okay. the last chapter does touch on the U.S. because I do talk about neo-Nazis and white nationalists, and that part does cover U.S. Uh, yeah. material, but most of it is still dealing with the Nazi period. Oh, okay. Uh, and I have actually, the first chapter actually deals with Charles Darwin himself, so I look at Charles Darwin's racism, uh, uh, so that's the first okay. chapter. Then there's, six, I think it's six chapters on the Nazi period, uh, and then the final chapter on white nationalism and neo-Nazism and okay. the alt-right. Well, that's good. Well, see, that leaves room for me to actually do something with my research in the future because you haven't covered every single aspect of eugenics. <laughs> so the, for the rest of us poor schlubs that are coming, you know, bringing up the rear of this train, we can – there's some room. You left something for us to write on. So, Because I've been looking at a lot of American stuff, and it's just really fascinating. And just the crossover is, is great, by the way. But uh, So, hey, for those people that are tuning in that don't know uh, where where – this is at or eugenics seems like a foreign word. Uh, can you tell us, uh, can you give us a quick definition of what is eugenics and what just sort of like, what's the, the, the Webster's kind of version of that? What could people understand it as? Yeah, eugenics actually comes from the root words that mean good heredity. And so it was a movement that began in the uh, 1860s with Francis Galton that was aimed at trying to promote good heredity, trying to improve human heredity. And there was a lot of fears around, especially by the end of the 19th century, that human heredity was declining, that people were, we were have seeing more people with disabilities, mental problems, and other kinds of things. And so there's this tremendous fear that, oh no, you know, we're going the wrong direction uh, in terms of uh, our biological makeup. And so the idea was we need to do, we need to take measures to try to improve uh, human humans biologically. Mm. Yeah, and I know that you know, a lot of people think of eugenics often as just, um, you know, racial cleansing. Or when we throw the name Hitler out there, we think, oh, just, you know, if it's not happening inside of a, you know, a, a concentration camp of some kind, then it's not. But it was a lot of other things, too. It was just marriage laws, right? And it was also sure. uh, different things to kind of keep uh, people from getting pregnant and medical things. Sure. Right, right. Yeah, so it crossed a lot over. Uh, yeah, there were two. There were, yeah. A lot of his, uh, historians have divided uh, eugenics ideas into two main categories, positive eugenics and negative eugenics. Positive eugenics was the idea of trying to do things to promote the prolific re reproduction of those with what mm -hmm. they considered good hereditary traits. So the people that are more uh, intellectual, people that ha are have uh, better physical characteristics or mm -hmm. whatever it is that you're trying to cultivate. Uh, so that's positive eugenics. So it's trying to promote having big families, you know, for those that have these positive traits that the, in their view anyway mm -hmm. the negative eugenics was the idea of trying to prevent the reproduction of those mm -hmm. who were defined as having negative uh, traits so people that were mentally ill or people that had physical disabilities people who were blind or deaf or whatever trying to find ways to prevent them from uh, 
reproducing. And of course, there were diff- within each of those categories, there were different ideas about policies and what you could do to actually try to do that. And the negative eugenics probably actually had a bigger impact in legislation uh, and of actual uh, concrete policies that were introduced to try to implement it. And one of the mm-hmm. most uh, thoroughgoing ways of doing that was trying to sterilize people. Mm. Well, I shouldn't say thoroughgoing. I mean, the, the Nazis even went to the extent of euthanasia, trying to kill people, you know, with yeah. mental dis- with disabilities, not just mental, but actually blindness and other kinds of disabilities. So they went to the, the extent of killing them. In the United States, however, there were quite a number of states that had sterilization laws. So there's compulsory sterilization for people who were mentally ill or had other traits that were defined as being, you know, negative or or ill, you know, hereditary illnesses and yeah. such. So there's a lot of different ways that people tried to get at uh, eugenics and trying to promote it. Uh, and it mm-hmm. varied from one person to the other, one eugenicist to the other, of how far they went in that uh, mm-hmm. sphere. The most radical ones did promote infanticide, abortion, uh, and even killing of uh, d- uh, disabled adults uh, at mm-hmm. times. Uh, yeah. Uh, not, not all eugenicists promoted that, of course. Many eugenicists yeah. were horrified by that. Yeah. kind of idea, many, many promoted sterilization or other kinds of marriage prohibitions or other kinds of things. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and when you talk about this, too, I think what's interesting is, you know, the question I was kind of wondering or wanted people to kind of consider is, you know, why is your um, your upcoming book? Why is this what you're talking about important for us to know? I mean, how is it relevant whether these hap- things happened 100 years ago, 50 years ago, if we're talking about Nazi, you know, 60 years ago, 70? Uh, you know, why is this sort of exploration of the history even relevant to our world? Haven't we, in other words, haven't we just got, we've, it's 2020, certainly we don't do these things today. So I think that's the mentality for a lot of people. So uh, maybe explain to people why this is, they should pick up a book like what you're talking about, why it's meaningful. Well, the word eugenics actually became sort of a dirty word after the World War II, in large part because of the Nazi uh, use of it. Uh, But actually, in the 1990s, there were some who began trying to redeem the word uh, once again, because we are still living in a world where people are still uh, trying to promote these kinds of ideas. I mean, we have there's a transhumanist movement right now that Mm -hmm. has some very prominent leaders, Oxford University professors, that is trying to promote selecting certain traits of humans and identifying them and trying to get those into the gene pool for the next generation mm. uh, and such. So, you know, we're at, and there's negative eugenics going on, too. I mean, amniocentesis is being used uh, to try to kill uh, babies in utero uh, who are identified as having traits that are considered uh, defective. So uh, Iceland uh, a few years back uh, was... Uh, jubil- jubilant that they had eliminated 100% of people with Down syndrome. Well, how mm. did they do that? They did them by aborting uh, the fetuses who ha- had amniocentesis and who are identified then as having Down syndrome. So yeah. we're still living with the same kinds of ideas about trying to eliminate people with different kinds of disabilities, about trying to promote uh, people with other kinds of uh, biological traits and such. So these debates are still going on today. And one of the underlying uh, mentalities that goes behind the eugenics movement and that I deal with a great deal in my book, The Death of Humanity especially, Mm -hmm. is the idea that certain human lives have value and other human lives don't have value or certain have more value and certain have lesser value. In fact, in the eugenics movement, it's uh, interesting in the early uh, 20th century, there was a lot of eugenicists who were bandying about terms like inferior and on the other hand, superior. Uh, but on the negative side, they were banding about terms of people with disabilities as being weeds, noxious, unfit, uh, mm-hmm. or even I've, I've even seen one calling them people of negative value. You know, so not mm-hmm. only do they have no value, they had negative value. They were a burden on society. There's another term that was used quite frequently about these people. Well, these same attitudes are still being rehashed today in a lot Mm of venues. So I think these are still live debates. Yeah. Well, it reminded me too, what you're saying, even Hitler's uh, phrase, you know, life unworthy of life, you know, the idea that there's people that are alive, they just aren't worthy. And I think that's what, uh, you know, what I think is the most important part of this is that what people have to understand, we talk about, you know, the racial component of it, um, whether it be skin color, uh, although I think historically they tend to see race as one human race, but it was sort of lower or higher kind of thing as opposed to mm-hmm. multiracial kind of things. But still the idea that, 
you know, okay, so somebody today may say, well, we don't do it based on black and white, but that doesn't mean they're not picking other arbitrary characteristics to just replace that one. They're still devaluing certain life, right, uh, on, based on some selection of characteristics. And that's the basic yeah, premise, right? Yeah, and a lot of times the characteristics were based on rationality, so it had to do with how much mental power you had. And I think that's mm. actually more prominent, especially among intellectuals who are pushing it uh, today. I mean, people like Peter mm. Singer, for example, who's promoting ideas about infanticide and, yeah. and euthanasia and such. And uh, basically, he bases it on rationality, the ability to be able to plan the future and other kinds of things that do with rational capabilities. Well, of course, he's a Princeton professor. He's he's a, he's high on the pecking order of rationality. You know, yeah. so uh, this isn't going to affect him unless he becomes uh, has, suffers from dementia later in life or something like that. Uh, mm. But uh this was a, a common trait also earlier on that it was based on rationality. And, but interestingly, you're talking about the racial aspect. Of course, in the early 20th century, many of these uh, eugenicists, many physicians, anthropologists actually thought that people of other races, such as black Africans, Australian Aborigines, even uh, perhaps American Indians, that they were lower in mental powers. And so there sort of were both of these things were sort of going hand together. It wasn't just because their skin color was different. It's because they thought that they were intellectually different and even morally different. And that's a point I bring out, by the way, in this new book I'm uh, uh, putting out about uh, uh, Darwinian racism, that they considered the moral uh, stature of different peoples to be different. So they thought that black Africans uh, were less moral, less cooperative, less uh, less hardworking and you know, all these good moral traits that they thought, whereas they thought that Europeans were hardworking, diligent, uh, honest, thrifty, mm. you know, think of all the good character traits you can think of. You know, they, they ascribed these all to the Europeans and all had these negative traits ascribed to then black Africans and others. And these, these ideas, by the way, are still being rehashed by white nationalists today. Uh, I was pretty astonished at how, uh, how parallel the ideas, which shouldn't really have astonished mm. me because they are, after all, often called neo-Nazis. So they, you know, they're just taking the ideas yeah. that were around in the early 20th century that were fairly common among uh, physical anthropologists, not just in Germany, but also in the United States and such. And they're taking these racist ideas and recycling them. Yeah. Hey, well, we did get one comment, uh, mostly, I think, critical of me. I think they like you, but I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> But uh, somebody named Brett, I'll, I'll put up the comment. He's he's basically asking that he wants you to remind me because he thinks I don't understand this. But uh, the, the institutional racism, the idea that, it, you know, what we did to institutionalize these things existed long before Darwin and it wasn't his fault. And he was a good guy and that racism existed long before that. I, so maybe maybe that's a good point to uh, just clarify, even at this point in our discussion that um, when we're talking about, when you even talk about, you know, Darwin to Hitler and, and his views and how that, that advanced that sort of scientific understanding of, of, of race and what was used in these white nationalist groups and by Hitler, that's not to suggest by you or me, sorry, Brett, but uh, that uh, Darwin invented the idea of racism or institutionalizing that practice, right? Um, sure, yeah, racism was long, far, be, far before Darwin and, and Darwin was going to, build upon ideas of race that, that pre-existed by centuries, uh, his yeah. uh, thinking. Uh, but what's interesting in the context of Darwin's own thinking is that he took these ideas and he used racism as a way to try to prove his theory of evolution. Mm -hmm. That is, he used it as evidence for his theory. So mm -hmm. one of the things that he had to prove in order to prove human evolution, which was, by the way, one of the biggest sticky points, is one of the most controversial ideas, and he knew it was the most controversial idea, which is why he didn't say very much about it in uh, Origin of Species. He barely mentioned uh, human evolution in Origin of Species. Right toward the end, the last couple pages, he just makes mm -hmm. a very brief comment about light may be thrown upon uh, human origins, but he doesn't really discuss it. Uh, then, of course, after the cat was out of the bag, after everyone else had already discussed it, and after lots of other people had already published about it, 12 years later, then he published his Descent of Man, where he actually does lay it out in great detail. Mm. Uh, but in the Descent of Man, one of his main ways of trying to argue for human evolution was to argue that uh, there's variation within the species, which, of course, is what he'd argued in Origin of Species relating to other species. He has to argue there's lots of variation within species and not, he has to try to minimize the variation between 
different species to try to show that it's just a continuum. There's no, you know, discrete, these species are just, you know, there's no discrete species that have been separately created or anything like that. He's trying to show they just sort of yeah. blend together. So the way he did this with humans was to argue that, that Australian Aborigines, black Africans and such are closer to apes than are Europeans. Uh, and that the Europeans and the Africans then have lots of differences between them, uh, intellectually and also morally and so he, he has a couple of chapters in fact just on race mm -hmm. on race and he has actually about a three-page section in the descent of man where that's entitled on the extermination of human races and in that uh, three-page section he argues that some races are necessarily going to go extinct in the universal struggle for existence mm -hmm. that's taking place because yeah. of the competition and he as he saw the Europeans going out and actually doing that that is committing genocide against Australian Aborigines, against Tasmanians, against American Indians. Uh, in, in South America, where he had some more direct in experience on his voyage of the Beagle, he went around the world on a voyage of the Beagle in the late 1820s, early 1830s. So he had direct knowledge of some of this that was going on. And in fact, he, during that time, he also visited us uh, in the South Sea Islands, too, on that uh, voyage and, and had experience there, knowing about what the Europeans were doing. So he knew that the Europeans were going out and committing genocide. He actually saw that as a progressive force, that the Europeans were displacing these allegedly yeah. inferior people with the superior Europeans. Now, again, Darwin got these ideas. These ideas fit very much into the Victorian context. He, it's, again, he didn't originate these ideas. These were ideas yeah. that, that were around with most uh, British imperialists of the time. Uh, but Darwin did share those ideas and tried to promote them as a, a scientific theory. Then after Darwin's time, uh, after it became enshrined in his own thinking, and once biological determinism became more prominent by the 1890s and early 1900s, uh, then Darwin's theory was used, interestingly, then to buttress the ideas of racism. And then there were people by the 1890s and early 1900s who were arguing that Darwinism proved racism. So Darwin yeah. was saying that racism proves Darwinism. And then after him came quite a number of thinkers that said Darwinism proves racism. Once you accept Darwinism, they said, then that proves yeah. there's variation in the human species. And so then, you know, they use this then to argue for racism. Yeah, so it's a little bit of a circular kind of argument yes. then ultimately is what yeah. you're saying is that, yeah, Darwin didn't invent those things, but he used it to validate his theories. And then once his theories were uh, sort of like, uh, I guess, the scientific consensus, then that, that became the grounding to say, well, then we're okay in doing these things. And I think that's a point worth worth maybe spending a couple seconds on, uh, you know, and, and maybe if you could explain, you know, how is how is eugenics really uh, a reflection of the scientific consensus of the day? Because that's a word I think we throw around a lot today. You know, scientific consensus, science says, scientists tell us. And we use that as if that has some sort of moral persuasion for whatever our goals are. You know, uh, science tells us this, so therefore we must do this, as if that controls our public policy. So I think I think what's I think it should be helpful to most people to understand is that science may tell us stuff, but that doesn't mean that you know it, it's telling us the right things or what the right things are to do right. morally in response to it. So mm -hmm. how was the how was eugenics the the scientific consensus of the day? Well, let me just say this before I get into exactly that question, because it's, okay. we were just talking about racism, and, I, and maybe I should yeah. just tie in racism with eugenics, too, before we move into this, because yeah, yeah. racism and eugenics are two separate ideas, uh, and you could be a eugenicist, in fact, without being a racist. That is theoretically mm -hmm. possible, just like it's theoretically possible to be a, a Darwinist without being a racist. Those two things yes. are not necessarily linked. Exactly. Uh, historically, they were pretty closely linked. And most eugenicists in the 1890s and early 1900s were racists. But the idea of eugenics was just improving human heredity. So you could you could be a non-racist and believe that you could want to improve human heredity because you want, you want to prove all human heredity of, of people of all races everywhere and such. So it wasn't necessarily it didn't have to necessarily be racist. The fact yeah. is, though, that most eugenicists in the 1890s and early 1900s were racist and they saw that as part of the eugenics program. So. A lot of times, most of what they were focusing on, though, was within their society trying to improve human heredity. So let's say in Germany, where I've done most of my research, uh, or in the United States, most of the scientists in Germany and in the United States that were promoting eugenics, 
uh, were actually promoting it within their own country. They were trying to mm. pass legislation to try to, to improve the, the heredity within uh, the United States or improve human heredity within uh, Germany. Now, in the United States, of course, there was uh, more multiracialism in the United States. So sometimes that did become uh, more closely linked to racism, people promoting anti-miscegenation laws, for example. Some of them were very pr uh, much seeing this as a eugenics approach, uh, immigration laws, uh, anti-immigration laws. In fact, the 1924 American anti-immigration law uh, or American immigration law was predicated upon eugenics in that they were trying to weed out yeah. immigration from people that they considered uh, lesser hereditarily. So people from Southern Europe, they considered inferior to people from Northern Europe. And so they wanted to put yeah. stricter uh, percentage, you know, less, they wanted less immigration from those places. They wanted less immigration from Ch from China. They wanted less immigration from other parts of the world where yeah. they thought people as heredity was, you know, yeah. but they were biologically inferior uh, mm -hmm. to the, the uh, white Anglo-Saxons. Uh, and so there were close connections between the racism and the, the eugenics uh, movement. Now, the question you just asked, and I'll see you. Yeah. <laughs> the scientific, I'll, 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 I'll ask you, I'll set you up again. Well, so, scientific yeah, consensus. This, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah, the scientific consensus at the time. Well, at the time, in the 1890s and first couple of decades of the 20th century, the scientific consensus for both scientific racism and for eugenics was pretty strong. Uh, most scientists did tend to believe in both of those things. Uh, if you look at the geneticists of the day, Charles Davenport was a Harvard University geneticist. He became really the leading figure within the American eugenics movement. He founded a, a, uh, a, a laboratory at Cold Spring Harbor uh, on Long Island uh, in New York that was actually called the Laboratory for Experimental Evolution. Mm -hmm. That was the title of his lab, and then they it also established a few years. That was established in, I think, 1904, right about there anyway, right at the first few years of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. And then in 1910, they established the Eugenics Records Office, which was trying to uh, uh, investigate genealogies. So Charles Davenport was one of the leading geneticists in the United States. He was not some uh, you know fringe person or something like that. And if you look at other geneticists in the United States at the time, it was very mainstream. There were courses in eugenics that were being taught in American colleges and universities around uh, all across the U.S. Yeah. Uh, I've seen some exams, by the way, on that. I've seen some exams. People have I've posted like uh, old tests. Like that uh, yeah. they had like with questions, you know, which of these people would you, you know, not want to see reproduce? I mean, they were asking like these questions on these exams. Yeah. And the same thing was true in Germany as well. And in, in the, in the, again, a lot of my investigations, historical investigations yeah. in the German field and medical professors, uh, anthropologists, uh, psychiatrists uh, were not that every one of them was a eugenicist. That's, of course, not the case either, uh, but probably a majority and certainly a, a very uh, it was considered sort of mainstream scientific and public policy mm -hmm. ideas at the yeah. time in the science community. There was a lot of pushback, a lot of the pushback that came against eugenics especially in the early 20th century, was from the Catholic Church, which was probably the largest institution to strongly oppose it, as well as some conservative Protestants. Uh, the liberal sort of mainline Protestant uh, denominations, though, generally lined up with eugenics. Again, it was considered sort of mainstream progressive ideas, and, and many of them uh, embraced it uh, as well in the early 20th century. There's actually a, a good book by Christine Rosen called Preaching Eugenics that talks yeah. about that issue, about uh, about those that uh, were within the religious community who were pressing for eugenics. And she argues that the Catholic Church and some conservative Protestants were the, the main forces who were opposing it in the places that did oppose it. In the United States, think about how mainstream it became. In the United States, by the 1930s, more than half the United States had compulsory sterilization laws, which were had eugenics as their purpose. Hmm. Yeah, and that actually, you, you see, you're so good at this interview stuff. You, I don't even have to ask my questions because you're ahead of me. So, <laughs> but uh, see, so make my lo my life so much easier. No, but I did want to maybe just uh, re emphasize that a little bit and touch on that idea of how that scientific consensus maybe influenced the church because, you know, this is not uh, in, in discussing this. I think a lot of times the pushback I get is, well, you know, you're arguing that. This is, you know, Christians good, non-Christians bad. And I don't think that's, uh, 
the, the nature of this thing. Uh, you know, I, I think, in, in my understanding, there are many Christians like uh, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, who have done a little bit of study on uh, some others who really integrated those ideas. So in, in your study, maybe maybe you did more in, in the Germany side uh, or from even the U.S., what you've read. And, and Rosen's book is excellent, by the way, a source for that. What, what's your take on, was there... Was that was there broad consensus in the church? Was that a minority in the church, uh, Catholic, Protestant, that that embraced that, uh, taking the lead of you know what this was the sort of the consensus of the day? We're just sort of going to follow along with that because I know that Rosen brings up you know preaching contests they had in the United States where send in your best right. eugenic sermon. Uh, but how prevalent was that? Was that really instrumental in a lot of the church or just a smaller segment? What do you, what's your take? Well, in the German scene, it does seem that the German uh, in Germany, theolo- theology tended to be much more liberal than in the United States, at least more widespread liberalism. Of course, in the mainstream uh, American churches, there also was a lot of theological liberalism as well. Uh, but in Germany, it was even more widespread. And there was in the Protestant church, there was much less uh, sort of conservative uh forces can, can theologically I and so yeah. there were, let me interrupt yeah, just real quick just yeah. before you go because that's a great point but I, I know some people may get lost when you're saying theologically liberal or theologically conservative that's not the same as political liberal or political conservative today no. right so maybe just no, you know I'm, just put a little dot on that i and explain to people what you mean by that brief as quickly as you can i don't want to distract from your main point but i don't want people to lose you either yeah. thinking you're making a sure. political claim here yeah the, those that would be considered theologically liberal, liberal would be those who were uh, generally uh, not uh, believing in the miracles of the Bible, for example, mm. not believing that the biblical text is uh, infallible and such like that. The conservatives, on the other hand, would be those who were generally held to the, the miracles of the Bible and the uh, infallibility of the uh, biblical text. So it's sort of, a, mm. in a nutshell, that's pretty much the con- broadly the camps that we're uh, defining. Obviously, there's a huge continuum, yeah. Uh, yeah. so it's hard to yeah. uh, nail this down, but uh, those are sort of the two you know, sides sure. that we're sort of broadly talking about. Yeah, that'll, but that'll Germany be helpful to people. Be, yeah, but Germany did tend to be more theologically liberal uh, than... Uh, than the United States. And because of that, they did tend to be more accepting of sort of whatever the scientists said, whatever the you know, progressives said, rather than uh, combative and, and uh, opposing it. Uh, interestingly, mm-hmm. the Catholic Church was much less accepting of the forces of uh, theological liberalism. And as a result, they did tend to uh, reject eugenics, especially when it began impinging on things that they thought were contrary to uh, moral philo- moral uh, moral philosophy. Yeah. So when people started talking about sterilization, the Catholic Church didn't approve of sterilization uh, for any reason, really. Uh, so uh, when mm. uh, eugenicists start pressing for sterilization, the Catholic uh, many Catholics, not all, there were actually some Catholics that were willing to go along with that, but most Catholics rejected that. And certainly once they started moving on to killing people with disabilities, mm. the Catholic Church was going to be one of the strongest voices against that. When the Nazis began moving in 1939 to begin killing people with disabilities in their so-called euthanasia program, uh, where they killed over the course of the, the war about 200,000 Germans plus tens of thousands of others in occupied countries, mm-hmm. uh, the Catholic Church was one of the strongest voices to protest against it. Uh, bishop, uh, one of the bishops of uh, Münster, uh, Bishop Galen, uh, preached a sermon very strongly against it in the summer of 1941. There also were a few uh, Protestant voices who, uh, not publicly but privately, wrote letters to Hitler and such, <laughs> things like that, although they were basically told to, to shut up and back off, and they didn't go public with it. Hmm. Uh, Galen actually did go public with his sermons. Uh, in fact, the British actually uh, leafleted uh, German cities with Galen's sermons about hmm. euthanasia uh, and such because they knew that even a lot of Germans wouldn't uh, support uh, euthanasia. Uh, the, that is the killing of people with disabilities. Yeah. So the Catholic Church did uh, did form something of a bastion in, in Germany in in uh, in uh, rejecting these ideas. So again, in thinking about you know the German context, there were uh, people, and of course there were Catholic scientists and such too, although one of the more prominent Catholic uh, 
scientist named Muckerman was actually uh, involved in eugenics and promoted uh, eugenics. So some Catholic scientists went along with the eugenics craze as well. Mm. Yeah, you know, and that's 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 really important, I think, for people to recognize. And one of the things that I've tried to look at my studies is I think they're, you know, the one that Christians can be a voice for things, even against the sort of consensus. But there's a there's a moral grounding for that outside of science that we can kind of hold on to. And when we let go of that, often it does not end well for uh, society when we kind of give in to those uh, pressures uh, in, in a wrong well, one way. Of the interesting things, one of the interesting things there, I think, is that a lot of times what happens is that scientists... Uh, when they are pressing for certain public policy positions. So eugenics, eugenics was supposed to be based upon science, but then of course, what to do about that is actually public policy. Then mm -hmm, do, you, yeah. do you sterilize people? Do you put marriage prohibitions? You know, what do you do about that? Uh, and a lot of times the scientists confused their science, which in this case wasn't on shaky ground as it was, but even if it had been good science, they confused their science with public policy yeah and thought that because they knew the science that therefore what they were proposing for public policy had to be what has to happen uh, yeah. and they sort of just rode roughshod over people's moral considerations i think we can see this happening in a lot of respects i don't want to get into all these issues today about those no, particular issues but i think we can see that today too the very same kind of things happening where scientists think well because i know my science and my science points to X, Y, or Z. Therefore, the public policy implications that it have to be this, this, and this. Yeah. And what happens is they forget about all the other things that may be important in life or might be going on, or you know, yeah. that, that one thing that they're focusing on may not be the only consideration. There may be other considerations yeah. that public policy has to take into account because public policy has to take all the, you know a myriad of things into consideration as to what yeah. is going to produce the best result. For, for us as humans. So when you get fixated on one thing, and sometimes scientists do this, but we all do, I mean, I'm not saying just scientists, okay? Yeah. All humans do this sometimes. You know, if you get fixated on one thing, and you think that therefore your public, you know, that my science says this, and then therefore the public policy has to be this, you know, there may be yeah. other moral considerations that other people may have. And that's, I think, yeah. part of what happened in the early 20th century. The Catholic Church had, had moral grounds to reject uh, sterilization mm -hmm. and euthanasia and they tried to apply those things and they were called obscurantists they were called anti-scientific you know for doing that yeah. you know for trying to raise moral objections uh, mm -hmm. to the public policy proposals being made by scientists and scientists were claiming that what they were doing was scientific and that basically case closed you know as far as they were concerned yeah and what you said there is such a great example of why the research you do that goes back 50 60 100 years is so relevant uh, you know, to today, because I think for me, at least when we study it outside of our own immediate context, it gives us a perspective to, uh, to see what's happening today and say, okay, wait a second, if that was true then, and this happened then, then maybe I need to be more cautious how I'm observing this thing today. And, and we've done whole shows, our group on Off the Cuff, we've done uh, whole shows on, you know, science, what are the limits of science, how do we, how do we read, we did a whole show just reading headlines and stories and showing people where they've made that same error you just pointed out, where they assume policy, you know, they assume science leads to a specific policy. And even the, the, the writers, it's not just, like you said, scientists, it's the, it's the people writing stuff and politicians say, you know, oh, well, COVID-19 caused this to happen. It's like, no, 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 wait. No, there's a policy that was enacted in response to it, which may or may not be right policy. Like you said, I don't want to get into that, but, but no, 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 it's the policy, the consequence of the policy, not the actual stuff itself that caused that. And if we're not careful in making that distinction, we end up going down that sort of road uh, in the wrong direction. I think that's what uh, you're, you're kind of pointing out here as a great illustration of why it matters so much. Well, let me ask you this then. So uh, obviously, uh, as Brett pointed out so earlier, so eloquently, uh, <laughs> uh, there's a lot of people that are concerned about institutionalized racism. I've used that before. To, and, I, and, I, and I, like you, I say, you know, I don't believe racism itself is entailed by Darwinian viewpoints, but it is coherent with the Darwinian wor wor worldview. So it's not necessary, but it isn't, uh, it isn't fought against either. There's nothing within that grounding that can say it's bad. Uh, that becomes a personal choice with appeals to something outside of that. Uh, 
But I guess what I would want to say is how was inst- racism or other issues of dehumanization, how are those institutionalized in the eugenics laws that got passed, whether in Germany or the U.S., whatever you have kind of that background on top of your head, uh, what, what did that look like when it came down to laws? How did those, that scientific consensus impact the way people were dealt with? Are there some spe- specific things you've discovered in your study, especially for this new book, that, may, that people might be surprised to learn? Well, I think we already uh, touched on a few yeah. of them to some degree. I mean, the mm-hmm. big, the biggest one was the sterilization laws, which yeah. began in 1907. Indiana was the first state in the United States to pass a compulsory sterilization law in 1907. Uh, and many states, California, where I'm at now, they passed theirs in 1909. Uh, California accounted for roughly 30,000 uh, compulsory sterilizations uh, from the mm. from 1909 up until the 1960s or so. I'm not sure exactly when they uh, ended it, but somewhere around there. Uh, many other states uh, we're going to continue on to. And, and in fact, in terms of the legal framework, uh, these laws did end up getting challenged all the way to the Supreme Court. And in 1927, the famous Buck versus Bell mm-hmm. uh, decision about eugenics, uh, uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes wrote the uh, majority opinion for the court, uh, which was very heavily lopsided in favor of this opinion that uh, compulsory sterilization was appropriate constitutional that it could be legal and they, I mean, they didn't they didn't mandate it of course but they were just defending a law that virginia had it was the virginia law that was being uh, under consideration at that point uh and they um decided that uh, as uh oliver winter holmes uh, famously said that three generations of imbeciles are enough that was referring to the generations of uh, uh carrie buck and her offspring and her parents and such. And uh, in that decision, uh, Holmes also stated that the the laws that uh, allowed for compulsory vaccination, which some states had at that time, were also were basically the same thing as cutting the fallopian, fallopian tubes. He drew that he drew that analogy. In yeah. fact. So uh, so legally in the United States, uh, sterilization was considered a, a legitimate practice. Uh, in, in favoring public health, you know, as public health measures, that was what was uh, used to defend it. Public health demands that we, you know, compulsorily sterilize certain people. Hmm. Uh, and so about 60,000 people in the United States were compulsorily sterilized, about half of those in the state of California uh, over the, the course of these eugenics laws uh, being in existence. Uh, then there, of course, Nazi Germany was going to take this to the greatest extremes. They not only passed a compulsory sterilization law when they came in power in 1933, uh, but then they also uh, began killing people with disabilities later on. But mm-hmm. it wasn't just Nazi Germany in the United States. Interestingly, uh, the Scandinavian countries were on the forefront of passing sterilization laws. So we think of the Scandinavian countries being progressive, and in many uh, senses they were uh, progressive. But Eugenics was considered a progressive cause, in fact, uh, in the early 20th century to a very large degree. Uh, there were not that there weren't conservatives that held it, uh, held it as well, uh, but many of them were progressives. Uh, and uh, so Scandinavia, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, they passed compulsory sterilization laws as well and compulsory sterilized people. So this was some of the more dramatic ideas relating to uh, sort of the le- legal issues relating to uh, eugenics. The other issue that sort of touches on it, though, was the immigration law that I mentioned earlier, 1924 U.S. immigration Mm -hmm. law, uh, which was also being pushed very strongly by eugenicists. Charles Davenport, uh, Harry Laughlin. Harry Laughlin was sort of Charles Davenport's right-hand man at the eugenics record office. Uh, Laughlin actually went to testify uh, to Congress uh, for that law to try to uh, make sure that people with sort of better heredity as they saw it uh, would be able to come into the United States and people with, you know, in what they considered inferior heredity would not be allowed to come in. So these are the kinds of laws yeah. that were actually uh, being implemented in the United States. But again, some other countries uh, did this as well. Interestingly, Britain, where the eugenics movement began, never actually passed a sterilization law oh, really? for eugenics. Yeah, no, Britain never did. 
Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. And and I think, you know, it's, it's good to point out here, too, you know, although often we discuss it uh, as, you know, uh, the white or non-white thing, which is a significant factor. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, you know, whites who were from Southern Europe were considered lower. Uh, and so were people who were uh, in poverty because that was considered or mental disease. That's, they were also considered uh, biologically inferior to some degree. So that they were on the chopping block as well. So if you were poor, they wanted you not marrying above your station, so to speak, because you would pass on those the poor genes, I guess you could say. Um, so I know that well, that yeah, was a fact. Generally, right? they, yeah, that's right. And it, it, a lot of times they sort of thought that your socioeconomic status was uh, commensurate with your uh, abilities, mental abilities, physical mm -hmm. abilities, and such. And so they there tended to be this idea that you know we're a meritocracy. So you know the people that uh, can achieve are going to, and the people that uh, are not achieving, just don't have the same abilities uh, that other people mm. have. And so, yes, there was very often a, this notion of people who are poor because they deserve to be poor and they deserve to lose in the struggle for existence, whereas people who are rich are uh, more uh, talented and uh, have greater uh, abilities and such. And, uh, and so they, there was no uh, acknowledgement of, uh, you know, social and economic circumstances that people came from shaping that. Yeah. Interestingly, though, uh, in Germany, uh, there was a little twist to this, though, because uh, Hitler, his party was the National Socialist German Workers Party. And so he actually did have a lot of sympathy for the working class and a lot of his rhetoric and such. And he actually argued that the German working class, uh, that the reason that many of them were living in poverty was because of capitalists oppressing mm. them uh, and getting a, the edge on them because of uh, unfavorable socioeconomic uh, conditions that they had. So uh, when he looked at successful Jews, he thought that they were successful because they were conniving and, you know, and deceitful and trickery, you know, trickery and other kind of greed and other kinds of things. Mm. Uh, and he was standing up for the, the German working class. In the United States, you don't see so much of that. You see, again, in the, at least in the eugenics movement, you don't. In the eugenics movement, largely, I think you're right. It's people who are the lower socioeconomic strata are considered to be sort of losers in the struggle for existence and and in the eyes of many eugenicists, sort of good riddance. Yeah. So, you know, that one one example I know, and this is more of a controversial one, so I'm, I'm curious to know, I know you wrote about this a little bit on Death of Humanity, uh, but uh, there's a lot of discussion about Margaret Sanger, Planned Parenthood. Um, and so maybe you can help people understand what was her connections to eugenics? Did, was she really trying to purify the human race by, you know, promoting abortion? Or was she just somebody truly concerned with the greater cause of humanity? Or maybe both. I mean, maybe she truly was generally concerned, but she thought the way that there was to uh, eliminate uh, you know, poor and, and, and black, and, you know, black people, uh, you know, that seems to be what I've read a little bit of it, but I'm sure you've done a lot more study and read some, maybe some more sources that other, maybe some of us don't have access to. Where, where do you, where does that story fit into the story you, you've been exploring these many years? Well, Sanger's a very interesting character and very complex in a number of ways. For one thing, in terms of her own personal experience, she did sort of get into her interest in birth control by having personal experience with women who were wanting to restrict their uh, births, uh, limit their births. Uh, and so she did have a lot of empathy for sort of women on the ground, people that were in uh, New York City who were, you know, struggling, you know, with uh, mm -hmm. already having uh, other children. And a lot of these, a lot of these were not uh, out of marriage uh, pregnancies either. A lot of these were pregnancies mm -hmm. within the context of marriage too. And so there was yeah. this aspect of it that sort of got her involved and interested in it. She was also, however, interested in uh, elevating the human race using birth control. And so she did see birth control as a method of uh, helping to improve human heredity. So in this sense, she did have uh, some of the same goals as the, the uh, uh, eugenics movement. However, interestingly, she had something of a... Uh, a love-hate relationship with the eugenics movement because a lot of eugenicists didn't approve of her methods because mm -hmm. they were concerned that her uh, basically, as they saw it, indiscriminate uh, uh, use of uh. birth control, that is allowing people of upper class to use birth control and trying to make it available yeah. to everyone, 
that this was then going to limit uh, the births of people with what they saw as good heredity. So the people who were promoting this positive eugenics idea that we have to have as many children as possible by the upper classes, they were concerned that Sanger's oh, yeah. promotion of birth control might undermine that. They were all supportive of her trying to get birth control for the lower classes and for people, uh, African-Americans and others who they considered lesser or inferior, but they didn't like the idea that she was willing to go further and to mm. uh, try to propose uh, uh, the ready availability of birth control for basically anyone who wanted it, uh, regardless of their hereditary, uh, you know, their hereditary mm. uh, makeup. Yeah. So in that sense, in that sense, some uh, eugenicists didn't like uh, her ideas. And so she never really fit in completely with the eugenics mm -hmm. movement, even though she did share some of their goals. I mean, she did say that one of her mottos was uh, to uh, breed a race of thoroughbreds. That was one of the mottos that was placed on her uh, eugenical, uh, on her, rather on her uh, birth control uh, review or whatever the name was of her journal. I'm trying to, mm. I think it was yeah. birth control, but I might have that wrong slightly. But anyway, it was, you know, to create a, a breed of thoroughbreds. That was one of her goals uh, yeah. of her birth control movement. And there were some prominent eugenicists that did join the, her birth control movement as well. Uh, Lothar Stoddard, if I recall correctly, was uh, a member of her birth control uh, movement. She's also, Sanger, though, has also received a lot of uh, controversy because of her uh, racism, because she also was racist and addressed the Ku Klux Klan at one point uh, mm -hmm. and did uh, make clear that she did see... Uh, uh, non-whites as being inferior and was hopeful that her birth control movement would help to limit their births. Hmm. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because, you know, for me, the more I've kind of looked into this, and this is even only like a sidelight into some of my my PhD stuff that I've been looking into, but it's just so such an interesting area of study. Mm -hmm. um, the more I see that that kind of thinking, I think uh, for me, I think I see it alive in in many respects today. I know I've read some sources that taught from eugenists that were uh, when Hitler kind of when it realized after the end of World War II what he was doing. I've read some things from some eugenists who really lamented the fact that okay, now our our work is going to be that much harder because people are going to associate us with these death camps mm -hmm. and the other things, and and so there was some discussions of uh, how we could be a little bit more. Uh, sly. How, how can we be? More, how can we still get our ideas out and still fit within the new public standard that didn't, you know, want to see what happened in Germany happen? So there's a lot of underground stealth, at least from what I've read, as far as how they tried to promote themselves and the language that they they tried to use in doing that. And I guess my question: this might be more controversial than other stuff, <laughs> believe it or not. Uh, <laughs> do you see eugenics? Um, are those ideas alive today at all? Is this something that we should, you know, you know, I'm not saying there's a eugenist under every rock and every, every politician's a eugenist because they disagree with stuff. I don't think we should be alarmist in that sense, but, but maybe be aware. Are there, are there those ideas alive today in our medical field and in our public policy or in our academics that, that say, okay, this is something I need to be aware of? Yeah, in the, when the word eugenics became sort of a, a naughty word in the, uh, post World War II period, uh, a lot of times they simply changed the names of their field, calling it human genetics or something else like that. And sometimes the same kinds of ideas were still uh, being promoted at that time. The big difference, it seems to me, between uh, eugenics today, which again I, I I'd argue it does still exist in, in a lot of ways, uh, but the big difference is that uh, eugenics today, that is people trying to promote good heredity uh, and trying to weed out, you know, people like with people with Down syndrome and such mm -hmm. like that, those kinds of ideas that are still going around today, it's not being state imposed in the same way that it was in the early 20th century. So in the early 20th mm -hmm. century, you had legislation that mandated that uh, compulsory sterilization could take place. And so at state run institutions, such as here in California, mental institutions and such, they were having uh, the physicians and such at those institutions uh, based on state, uh, using the power of the state to mm -hmm. compulsorily sterilize people. Uh, so it was a, a state mandated uh, kind of institution. Today, mm -hmm. uh, eugenics is being done on a more voluntary basis. So it's being done by 
individuals. So an individual decides whether when, when a person discovers that they have, they do amniocentesis, they find out that, you know, they have a, a baby in utero with Down syndrome, the individual decides whether they're going to carry that uh, baby to term or whether they're going to uh, abort that baby. Now, of course, there's social pressure. So when I say it's an individual decision, <laughs> there's other things going on, too. There's social pressure. In fact, I, I actually have a friend uh, who uh, had a baby with Down syndrome. And at the birth, the physician's response was, how did this happen? Oh, gosh. Because it should because <laughs> he thought it shouldn't have happened. Oh, my you know, goodness. He thought that baby should have been aborted. Uh, and so he was... Uh, horrified that this baby with Down syndrome had come into the world. Uh, so yeah, there's social pressure and such, but ultimately the individual does get to decide. Now, one time when I was challenged by someone about, you know, look, you know, the these things aren't happening anymore. You know, this eugenics in the early 20th century, you know, would be mandated by the government. Th these just aren't happening anymore. And someone was challenging me that. My response to that was, you know, I'm not really sure that, you know, millions of people making an individual decision for some particular thing somehow makes it better than a state mandated uh, thing going on. The issue yeah. is whether it's moral or not, not whether, you know, how the decision making process takes place. And so yeah. I think that's where we need to confront it. That's where we need to think about it. We need to think about is, you know, eliminating people with disabilities through abortion, euthanasia, whatever, are these moral things to do or not, not who gets to make the decision. I mean, well, who gets to make the decision is important. I'm not saying it's not yeah. important. It is yeah, an important yeah. question, too. But it's only, it's only important question once you've decided the other question as to whether yeah. it should be legitimate at all. In other words, uh, to think about the issue of, let's say, assisted suicide. Yeah. If assisted suicide is wrong, then there's no one to, then, then there's no question that goes beyond that about who makes the decision because there's no decision to be made. Yeah. Only if that is d deemed to be a morally proper decision in the first place, would you then go to the next question and ask, well, who gets to make, who gets to decide? Does the individual get to decide? Yeah. Does their family get to decide? Does the state get to decide? You know, who gets to decide what happens? First, you have to ask the question, is it moral in the first place? Yeah. And that's, uh, to me, the more important question. And uh, my own view in, in issues like assisted suicide and euthanasia, I don't think it's moral in the first place. I think there's strong arguments to be made morally against it. And so the, the next step of whether the individual decides or whether the, the, uh, uh, whether the collective, whether it's individual decision or collective decision, to me that doesn't arise because yeah. I think both of them are wrong. Yeah, and I think I think maybe to relate that so people can understand, uh, especially because you know, when, when you're committed to something, sometimes you can't see past the blinders of where you're at. And so just as a as a issue that's a hot button issue today on, on race stuff, let, you know, to give an analogy, I think that's fair there. So if if we had go back, you know, 50 years ago when there was what they call redlining uh, laws that didn't allow banks to loan to uh, minorities because they came from depressed neighborhoods and as a way of controlling certain things of where they could live, where, you know, there was realtors could lose their license if they sold a, a black person a home in a white neighborhood, those sort of things. So clearly we could say, OK, look, there's racism at play. But if we said, OK, those laws have been expunged, but I, I know this realtor guy who refuses to sell homes to the black people or I know a doctor who refuses to do surgery because somebody's black, uh, that wouldn't make it any better just because it's one person. It, it may not be as pervasive. It may not be as uh, maybe not be forced on people, but that doesn't make it morally any better. And I think if people think through that in the context of other issues, we wouldn't do that in those areas. So I think your argument here carries along the same line of thinking, whether it's through law or whether it's individual choice. If something is wrong, it's still wrong, uh, regardless of the magnitude of it. You know, uh, yeah. just you know, somebody may not kill millions of people like Hitler, but if they killed ten people for the same reasons, it's still life that's that's gone. So. Let's close with this because, you know, we have a few minutes left and I wanted to ask you this this question. It's really kind of uh, kind of builds off that a little bit. So how can we as Christians uh, who are committed to this idea of the sacredness of every human person? You know, we're not like the singers who say, well, there's life, but then there's less life. There's, you know, how much awareness they have. They, they, you know, it's human life graded on a curve. You know, it's the bell curve of, of value. But we say, you know, OK, folks like myself would say, OK, all human beings are created in the image of God and therefore have a sacredness about them. That doesn't mean I can, you know, kill them based on these other uh, 
uh, arbitrary, uh, although certainly impactful, but, but often arbitrary characteristics. How do we do a better job of protecting people uh, from these sort of eugenics ideas? Is there something that, like, if you thought of this over years, is there some way, what could we do as individuals to do a better job of saying, I'm going to stand and protect these things somehow? Well, I think one thing is we need to uh, think through these issues in a way that uh, gets at the root of the issues. I mean, I think you laid it out pretty well here, too, that, you know, if you ha if you don't have a basis for believing in human equality, and that isn't based in, you know, humans being created in the image of God. I mean, you think about, you know, Thomas Jefferson's dictum in the, the Declaration of Independence, where he said that all men are created uh, equal and are endowed by the Creator with inalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You know, uh, those basic, you know, premise that's in that uh, statement, if we don't uh, uphold those consistently everywhere in our thinking, uh, then we can slip into these areas. And so I think p part of what we need to do is sort of say, get to the root of the matters mm. and make sure we uphold these ideas of human equality, of human, uh, the sanctity of life, which we could call it, or, or simply that, that human life has value, if you want to state it a different way, that human life is valuable just because it's human life, not because it has some particular characteristic about it, not because it has rationality, not because it has, you know, some other particular uh, characteristic. In fact, one, th one of the things when I, uh, when I, uh, de I debated Peter Singer uh, on uh, Unbelievable uh, Radio, mm. and in my debate, and you can go online and on uh, on their website and, and listen to that if you're interested. But when I debated Peter Singer, one of the things that I challenged him about was uh, sort of the arbitrariness of the characteristics that they chose to define as what gives human life value. Mm. Well, he we wouldn't say human life value; he'd say just what gives a, some life value. Yeah, uh, and I challenged him, and I said, look. Joseph Fletcher, who was one of the key leaders of bioethics in the mid 20th century, laid out 15 different uh, characteristics of humans that he thought, you know, endued them with value. You know, Singer has several that he's bandied about rationality, ability to plan the future and things like that. And so I basically challenged him on that and said, you know, you know, how can you decide which of these features gives human life value? And Singer really didn't give me an adequate response. I was kind of stunned because this is sort of central to his yeah. This whole uh, view of humanity, I was kind of. But he said basically, he said, "Well, we can, uh, you know, we can discuss that. You know, we can talk about which of these characteristics are." I thought <laughs> he was never. I thought he was going to have a, you know, a, a, a knockdown argument for why his particular ones, you know, were were the ones. Yeah. Uh, but he didn't really give me that. I was kind of surprised yeah. at that. Uh, I mean, I'm not saying that he doesn't believe it and doesn't have reasons for it, but I was kind of surprised that he couldn't have it. But and they are arbitrary, I think. Yeah. in many ways. I mean, Fletcher can lay out certain characters. What about, you know, what about aesthetic sense? What about moral sense? You know, what, wh why are these, you know, why, why would you choose one of these rather than another as being a human characteristic that gives humans value, but rationality you know, becomes sort of the primary yeah. one. So yeah. anyway, I think, I think emphasizing those elements, I think is key and making sure we keep those central uh, mm -hmm. and then just trying to uh, implement those in all areas of our life. Yeah. Yeah, I started a, a project for that conversation, actually, because it's been so significant. I started actually making these shirts that um, uh, that have in Hebrew, Beselem Elohim, you know, from Genesis 127, which just says, in the image of God, and uh, trying to generate those conversations. Because I think even if people can't preach a sermon, if they can't write a book like you're writing or, you know, or, or do whatever, everybody can have a conversation with their friend or their family member and say, you know, what makes you valuable? What makes, is, what makes your life worthy of life? And is there some reason to devalue it based off if you're not as beautiful as Brad Pitt or, you know, as smart as whoever, you know? Um, and I think, I think just having those conversations, even as parents with kids, is pretty critical. So I'm sure. hoping people will listen to a conversation like this and, and start having some conversations with family members and with, with their kids to get them thinking about these things before... Uh, it's too late in their own life where they've bought into something and th without even realizing what the consequences of that mm -hmm. are. So I appreciate your work and, I, and all that you're doing, and I, Godspeed and all that continue that. You're in semi-retirement now. Uh, folks can uh, find out about you. I think they can Google here or there or connect on Facebook, I guess. You don't really have a website, right? 
No, not my. There's Darwin to Hitler dot com, which is uh, Discovery Institute has out uh, about oh, okay. some of my stuff. I'm not sure how. I'm not sure how updated it is though. Uh, yeah. But yeah, you can you can Google my name and find some YouTube video. I've done some YouTube lectures and yeah. different things uh, that put I'll put up there. So yeah, there's yeah. other things there. And my book Death of Humanity sort of gets at this last issue we were talking about too. And so I, you mm-hmm. know, I'd kind of recommend that yeah. book. as sort of one of my most important works, I think. Yeah, yeah, and I'll have links to those as well for everybody uh, at morethancake.org. Uh, I will post this video archive up as well. It'll go up on YouTube, and then I'll post this along with some liner notes of links to uh, Richard's books and other things. And, and down the road, when he has his, his book comes out, I'll probably do a review or post some information there as well to try to get people uh, even sight unseen. I know it's going to be good stuff. So, Richard, thank you again for your time and, and for coming on the show. I appreciate it, and uh, God bless you, man. Yeah, thanks for having me.